everyone. I'm David Zucker, and I sometimes fill in here at the Congress Complexes. I'd like to remind everyone that we have several rules here. First of all, one tool at a time. Second, no personal attacks. That's it. Third rule is referred to the first two. Okay. All right. Are there any announcements? Yes. Let's. Uh, okay, Charlie. Um, we also got to talk about the format real quick. Right. The format is as follows: We're going to have announcements. Then the speaker is going to talk for about an hour or so. Then we're going to have questions and answers. But as with Jeopardy, questions must be in that form. You got a speech you want to give? Save it for the robotics. And after that, the speaker gets the last word. Don't forget about the dismissal time, 845, 7.45. Closes, 745. We shut down a Zoom call, transfer the uh, transfer the host controls to somebody else so that they can keep going. We still officially stopped the meeting, but it'll it'll be open. Either Kelvin or Charlie can take the controls of the Zoom. And then if we don't have uh and then uh, we'll officially close the proceedings here at the restaurant at 7.45 because they close at eight. And uh, let's uh, get started with the announcements. You want to, you got any announcements, Andy? Are you guys got any announcements? Well, let's let Charlie go first because I know he's going to have the uh, college here real quick. Okay, Charlie, you ready to make the announcements yet? Yes, sir. As soon as I get this, as soon as I get the screen up, we'll be ready. Takes a minute or two to get this stuff done. So, um, all right, Charlie, let me share a screen and we'll be ready to go here, okay? All right, Charlie, um, we're ready, so go ahead. All right, waiting on the screen. Okay, Charlie. Okay, welcome uh, to meeting three, number 3,695, I believe it is, of the College Complexes. The playground for people who think. Okay, just some <coughs> announcements here uh, during the presentation. Would everyone please kindly mute? Put a big red X over the microphone so that the uh, 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 speaker is not interrupted. Um, now, we maintain a Google and a uh, a Google email group, uh, which I recommend that you join. There's instructions there at the center top uh, of the schedule. There also is a meetup group that functions in the same way. It only takes a few seconds to join. And I recommend you do that. There's not a lot of traffic on it, uh, but it'll keep you up to date regarding the upcoming programs. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On November 26th, uh, we will listen to a presentation by uh, Professor Robert Lichtenberg, a longtime regular of the College of Complexes. He also operates a monthly philosophy group which is something of an adjunct organization of the college, a monthly meeting of the, the seekers to discuss topics of philosophy. Anyhow, he will be talking about a subject, I think which would be very beneficial to any number of you and is how to think logically. Uh, Robert is an author of, a, now it's upwards of eight books on philosophy. So let's presume that he, in fact, like any of our speakers, knows what he is talking about. Now, the next open dates quite possibly might be December the 3rd. We're waiting to confirm a speaker, but the other one is December the 10th. So if you'd like to speak, those dates are open. After that, the next open date is January 7th. We will not be meeting uh, on the two dates adjacent to Christmas and New Year's. So we'll have a little break uh, in the schedule there. If you'd like to speak, please put together a title and a brief description 
pay your presentation and send it to me and we'll get you on the schedule. Okay, uh, other things we've got coming up. Uh, we should have a special presentation regarding the holidays yeah. put together by our own Tim Bolger. Oh, He's oh. putting the work on it. Yes. So that'll be on December the 17th. Uh, I'm just gonna buy out the North Pole. <laughs> right, and I should add, uh, on January the 6th is the birthday of the college of complexes. So we'll be getting another year older. I think we're about 74 years old now or something like that. All right, take it away, sir. Thank you very much. All right, David, go ahead and introduce our speaker. All right, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's speaker, Linda Phoenix, grant writer is gonna talk about healthcare. Give it up for Linda Phoenix. All right, remember, please mute. All right, Linda, go ahead. Great, thank you. Can everybody see the screen? It's not yet, you gotta share it. Oh, okay, hang on. What did I do? Thank you. Bottom share screen, you know how to do this. Yeah, let me get out of this. Let me see what I've done here. Okay. The Zoom app should open up with no trouble. Yeah, hang on one second. Okay. We'll let All it right. cut out, don't worry. Okay, Linda, we can see it now. Okay, let me get it on. Okay, now, do you want to go to, uh, you know how to start from the beginning and go ahead. Yes, so can you all see that? Yes, we can. And how, can you hear me? Is my volume good? Yes, we can. Great. Can you find? Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak to you. I've been to your gorgeous city one time. I fell in love with Chicago. I can't wait to go back. And I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you today about Medicare ACO REACH, formerly called direct contracting. And I'm going to tell you why it's a threat to seniors and the future of Medicare but also give you some hope. There's a lot of fighting back against this program. And I'll also include some action steps that you can take. Again, my name is Linda Phoenix and I am a grassroots healthcare justice activist. I'm also a member of Physicians for a National Health Program, which for over 30 years has been a leading advocate for universal comprehensive single payer national health insurance. I'm also a member of National Single Payer approaching its second year as a national grassroots organization that organizes locally, but focuses on the struggle for national single payer healthcare, which can only be achieved at the national, with national legislation. Uh, I should let you know that I'm not a healthcare professional. My career was in the arts, performing arts, and I was fortunate in when I started my career to land a faculty position teaching dance at a university that offered health insurance. I'm gonna tell just a little short story uh, so you can kind of understand why I'm so interested in uh, healthcare. <coughs> and then I'll uh, launch into information about the ACO REACH program. So um, I was fortunate, as I said, to have health insurance, but most artists are uninsured. They tend to be uh, self-employed and it's hard for them to afford health insurance. And, but I also learned early on that employer-based health insurance doesn't mean you're exactly out of the woods. I heard stories from other employees at the university about how so much of their paycheck was eaten up by health insurance if they had to cover an entire family. I married a psychologist and learned more about the, our healthcare system as he was constantly dealing with health insurance companies, trying to get coverage for his uh, clients to get insurance company, companies to um, deliver the care they promised uh, in their policies. And he spent a lot of time on the phone talking with them. He called it the mother may I phone calls. And then I started to notice healthcare horror stories in the news. This was in the 80s and the 90s. And that, that wasn't just people uh, without health insurance. 
people living on the margins. It was also people with health insurance. And those were the days when you would see stories about bake sales to raise money to pay for people's health care bills. Those, of course, have been replaced by today's crowdsourcing and other kind of online fundraising. So in a real sense, nothing much has changed. As things always happen, these things hit home. And my mother contracted a difficult to diagnose illness that would take her life. And it was another lesson about how employer-based health insurance doesn't always end up being a panacea. My family fought almost daily with her health insurance company to get the care that was promised in her policy. My husband discovered PNHP in the early 90s and we thought, oh, maybe America's really gonna reach for something here, but uh, nothing happened yet. And then here comes the Affordable Care Act. I wondered what if any impact that would have on our healthcare crisis. I know people who've been helped by the ACA, which covers about 30, many, 30 million people in the country who purchase healthcare on the exchanges. But for so many, they can't afford the health insurance or they make too much to qualify for a subsidy. So uh, basically the beat goes on, things kind of have gotten worse as we learned during COVID, which it revealed our broken healthcare system, decayed public healthcare system, racial inequities. And in the spring of 2021, I joined a work group called National Single Payer and word was getting out about this DCE program, uh, healthcare justice organizations like PNHP and others were like very concerned about it and the fight was on. So for me personally, after years of watching people around me have difficulties in our dysfunctional healthcare system, the one thing that I wanted and certainly it happened for myself and my husband is that seniors, at least once when you, you got to 65, you could count on Medicare specifically traditional Medicare, which is the uh, route I went. And now that program is being threatened. And so this is what I'm gonna talk about tonight, including, as I said before, offering action steps. So what is ACO REACH, formally called direct contracting? I wanna tell you that I'm gonna use ACO REACH and direct contracting or DCE interchangeably. I want you to be familiar with both of those names. And it'll make sense when I start talking about letters that could go out with seniors. It's important to understand both of those names. But originally, it was a pilot program launched late in the Trump administration called Direct Contracting. And basically, it's been continued by Biden under the new name ACO Reach, and it's going to change the way that Medicare pays for seniors care. Instead of paying doctors and hospitals directly, Medicare gives third party middlemen called ACO reach entities a monthly payment to manage seniors care, allowing the companies to keep its overhead and profit what they don't spend on medical services. It's already ominous, they're already incentivized. So, how does HCO reach direct contracting differ from traditional Medicare, which is, by the way, sometimes called original Medicare? Well, in traditional Medicare, Medicare pays providers directly for patient care. Pretty straightforward. But in direct contracting, Medicare pays the DCEs or the ACO reach companies a set amount each month to manage patients' health. So basically, it's a middleman between um, Medicare and the provider in between the provider and the patient. How could such a radical change to traditional Medicare happen completely under the radar? It is amazing how many people do not know about this program. And that's because REACH's predecessor direct contracting was developed by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI. This is an obscure agency within the Department of Health and Human Services that has the power to implement pilot programs to Medicare or Medicaid and scale them up completely to those programs without congressional approval or oversight. They'll take on a pilot project if they believe it will reduce spending without decreasing quality 
or improve quality without reducing spending. And it's not supposed to deny or limit coverage or provision of benefits. Well, you cannot do all of those things and also make a profit. It just doesn't work as we've seen with the Medicare Advantage plans. So essentially, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has about 11 agencies. One is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And here comes that little obscure agency, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And most people don't know that this came out of CMMI of the Affordable Care Act. And I think it started in 2011. It's very possible. It was designed with good intentions, but it has really become a devil's playground. So what is ACO REACH? Right now, there are about 91 direct contracting entities. They're going to run through the end of this year. And that doesn't mean they're going to go away. These are the ones that were already accepted under the Trump administration. They're just going to be grandfathered in as ACO reached direct contracting. Because remember, the Biden administration basically did a few little tweaks here and there, got some really pretty language, and just, just renamed this program ACO Reach. That officially starts January 2023. How many companies will there be? I'm not sure, but last spring was the open enrollment when companies could apply to become an ACO REACH. So we will definitely have more of them. Now that we've peeked under the hood about the agency responsible, um, we also need to understand this, that DCEs already operate in most states in the US, even though these are supposedly pilot programs. And virtually any type of company, regardless of healthcare experience, can apply to be a DCE or ACO REACH entity, including commercial insurers and venture capital investors. And once again, applicants are approved without input from Congress. So in review, we went from traditional Medicare, where Medicare pays doctors and hospitals directly, to direct contracting model where we inserted a middleman between Medicare and providers. But there's another set of players that are even more important than the DCEs, which are the Wall Street investors who fund the DCEs. They are flooding the DCEs, these ACO reach programs with new money. And these investors aren't stupid. They only put their money where they expect big profits. So how does a company with the stated goal of improving care and saving money make a big enough profit to keep its investors happy? Basically, how do ACO reach entities make money? They maximize revenue that they get from Medicare. They minimize revenue spent on patient care. They enroll more beneficiaries. So how do they maximize revenue? How do they get Medicare to give them more money? It is upcoding, sometimes called risk gaming. By making seniors look sicker than they are, rich entities can get higher monthly payments from Medicare, regardless of how much care patients actually receive. The Medicare insurance firms have been inflating patient health conditions and risk calculations for years. What does risk coding look like? So this is typical coding right here. This is a 76-year-old female patient. She's got some common diagnoses and each condition gets a score. The total score, and for her it's 1.03, that's gonna determine how much money Medicare pays the DCE each month. So for this particular uh, patient, Medicare would pay for the entire year $9,000. And remember that this has nothing to do with the actual care provided. It's just a description of conditions. This is a risk assessment of what they believe that this patient could cost. Look what happens with upcoding. It's the same patient. Obesity becomes morbid obesity. Diabetes now includes retinopathy. Asthma is now COPD and so on. 
And because of those higher risk scores, Medicare must now pay the DCE a whopping $32,000 regardless of the care provided. Upcoding has been a real problem in Medicare Advantage and it will be with the ACO reach. Very recently, there was a investigative article in the New York Times about the Department of Justice going after fraud in Medicare Advantage. It's a very detailed article. I encourage you to read it. These are some of the quotes that really popped off the page for me. Last year, DOJ Civil Division listed Medicare Advantage as one of its top areas of fraud recovery. Eight of the biggest Medicare Advantage insurers, which represents more than two thirds of the market, have submitted inflated bills according to federal audits. The government now spends nearly as much on Medicare Advantage's 29 million beneficiaries as on the Army and Navy combined. This is enough money that even a small increase in the average patient's bills adds up. The additional diagnoses led to 12 billion in overpayments in 2020. One former top government official suggested those overpayments in 2020 were probably more than 25 billion. Overpayment to Medicare Advantage companies has been going on for years. Government Accountability Office, GAO studies have been released about this, MedPAC reports, numerous articles over the course of four presidential administrations have highlighted overpayments to Medicare plans. We know what to expect with ACO reach. These are two other quotes that really kind of hit me. Donald Berwick, who was the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Administrator under the Obama administration, basically he should know. His quote is that even when they're playing the game legally, he's talking about Medicare Advantage, we're lining the pockets of very wealthy corporations that are not improving patient care. And in Texas, our Lloyd Doggett, who chairs the House and Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, basically talks about the powerful insurance lobby Medicare Advantage lobbyists have built strong support for their companies in Congress, and that's on both sides of the aisle. How do ACO REACH entities make money? ACO REACH entities, we're back to this new program, they're allowed to keep as profit and overhead what they don't spend on medical services. This, of course, is a dangerous incentive to ration and restrict seniors' care. These financial incentives do not exist in traditional Medicare. This program threatens Medicare solvency, the trust fund, if you will. Medicare Advantage has taken a real chunk out of the trust fund. ACO REACH will certainly uh, do even more to, um, to make Medicare insolvent. This threatens seniors' health and healthcare choices. And ACO, basically how it threatens Medicare solvency. In traditional Medicare, the government spends 98% of the budget on patient care, 2% on overhead, because the government's not in it to turn a profit. The REACH entities or the DCEs, this is what is really alarming. They may only spend an estimated 60% of what Medicare pays them on patient care, keeping 40% as overhead and profit. No wonder Wall Street is flocking to invest in these companies. So just to kind of give you a comparison here, if you look at traditional Medicare on the left, as I said in the previous slide, there's 98% on patient care, 2% overhead. We look at Medicare Advantage, these are the commercial health insurance companies where Medicare requires them to spend 85% on patient care. They get to keep 15% with, as overhead and profit, but look at the ACO REACH entities. There doesn't seem to be um, a requirement 
uh, as there is in Medicare Advantage, the 15% re requirement, it is believed experts that are stating that they could keep as much as 60% for um, spend on patient care and keep 40% as overhead. So basically up to 30 million seniors, and I'm one of them, I actively chose traditional Medicare and I could be automatically aligned with a REACH entity without my full knowledge or consent along with all the other millions of seniors. How does that happen? If a senior's primary care physician is part of a REACH entity, the Centers for Medicare Services will automatically align the senior with that entity. And so you may get a letter that looks like this, which most of us would toss in the trash, especially because we're looking for that. Oh good, I don't have to do anything. There's nothing to worry about. And when a senior is auto aligned to their doctor's reach entity, the only way to opt out is to change primary care physicians. And I understand you can't call Medicare uh, for centers for Medicare uh, and ask them, you know, can you give me a list of primary care physicians who are not aligned with the DCE? I've heard that you, you get no help. You're basically on your own trying to find another primary care physician who's not aligned with the DCE. This would be hard for anyone, but this is also especially difficult for uh, people in rural or underserved areas. This is asking seniors to change primary care physicians. Let me just say it undermines the choice that was promised to us. There is the promise that if seniors wanted to choose traditional Medicare so they could go to the provider of their choice, they could do that. And this is a radical transformation of Medicare. This is by design. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation plans to expand ACO reach to all of traditional Medicare within a decade. Basically, the plan is to completely and totally privatize all of Medicare by 2030. So let's just look again and be reminded about this under the radar um, agency, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, where this monster uh, was developed. And let's look at who is responsible for developing it. This fellow here is Adam Baylor. He's the founder and CEO of Landmark Health. And excuse me, Landmark Health is a home health company, which by the way, was later awarded a DCE contract. I'd also like to mention that this man was a former dorm mate of Jared Kushner. So he was brought in to direct the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation under Trump. And he wasn't even there for very long, April 2018 to July 2019. And what he did is he contracted with Oxion and Oxion basically pulls together investors to invest in different healthcare companies. This is, uh, this is one of the entities that pulled together funding for his landmark health company, which he did put in a blind trust before he went to work for the government. But nonetheless, Landmark Health was awarded a DCE contract after he left. And in January 2019, ahead of the launch of this new direct contracting model, keep in mind, uh, Mr. Baylor was gone by then, the Office of the General Counsel for the Health and Human Services Department warned in comments on a draft of the proposal about this program, that it appeared as if it was being to set up to benefit specific companies. Apparently, uh, this was a, uh, the proposal, the Intercept was able to obtain a copy of it. And in some of the parts of the proposal, there were regular references to organizations like Chin Med, Oak Street Health, Oak Street Health, by the way, was a company that would be would basically become a, a DCE. So after Baylor co-founded left uh, CMMI, he co-founded Rubicon Partners. What is it doing? 
It's of course partnering with physicians groups to form DCE and Medicare Advantage companies. So basically we've all heard about the revolving door and it was alive and well in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Now let's look at the other side. This is Liz Fowler. She's responsible, she's uh, with the Biden administration for rebranding the DCE scheme with a new name, calling it ACO Reach. She was the former vice president of public policy and external affairs for WellPoint. That's a giant health insurance company that later became Anthem. And she played a critical role in the writing of the Affordable Care Act. She was the chief health counsel to the Senate Finance Committee chairman, uh, Max Baucus. And as I said, she played a role in the writing of the ACA. She wrote that health care bill to protect the future and the profits of the industry from which she came. I would point out that in 2020, Anthem reported over $4.5 billion in net income. After she left the Obama administration, she was a lobbyist for Johnson & Johnson, pharmaceutical industry, and then she was brought back in under the Biden administration to direct the CMMI. There was incredible pushback against the uh, direct contracting program when everyone was figuring it out, and basically what she did is she was responsible for leading the charge just to give it a better name, kind of reframe some of the language, make it sound better, et cetera. But the key essential features of this program have remained the same. And it's important to understand that she has openly advocated for the complete privatization of Medicare and Medicaid by 2030. So the revolving door business is a business imperative or for-profit health insurance companies as well. So won't Congress try to stop it? Well, first of all, because of this happening in an agency most people had never heard of, including members of Congress, they didn't know about it. About a year ago, a group of physicians, a delegation, basically went to the doorsteps of the Department of Health and Human Services to deliver 13,000 plus petitions to Secretary Becerra, who heads the HHS, demanding an end to Medicare direct contracting. Secretary Becerra has the authority to end this program. These are some of those wonderful physicians there, photograph of them. I would point out they went during the height of COVID, put their lives at risk to do this. They also held a a press conference while they were there, but maybe the most important thing they did is they had lots of meetings with staff members of Congress to start to really educate them about how bad this program is. So elected officials started putting the pressure on HHS to cancel REACH, which he has the power to do. And um, about a year ago, or coming up on a year, 54 members of Congress sent a letter to Secretary Becerra demanding an end of the DCE program. I looked up to see who signed it in Illinois, Marie Newman, Jesus Garcia, Danny Davis, and uh, Jan, Sh I never can say her name, Shokowski. Sorry, I probably did a terrible job with that. So the efforts to educate Congress and the public have been ongoing. This is all the good news. The bad news is, of course, that DCE and ACO reach owners and investors are fighting back to protect their profits. So before we get to some action steps of how you can help, I just wanna point out a Texas champion. Um, and there's, I know there's at least three Texans on this call tonight. And this goes over much better in Texas because people wanna guess who the uh, legislator is. This is the one of the uh, folks early on to sound the alarm about this program. And this is Lloyd Doggett. He is the Ways and Means uh, Health Subcommittee Chair, incredibly knowledgeable about health policy. And he, along with three other members of Congress, were sounding the alarm um, in 2020 about this program. This is a letter that he sent to Secretary Becerra and also to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Administrator. She also has the authority to stop this program. 
I'm just going to highlight some things. This is a recent letter because he does such a masterful job of connecting this program to Medicare Advantage. He understands, he, he sees that it's the same business model, but really only worse in a lot of ways. So he talks about the auto enrollment feature in ACO reach. You're automatically aligned and you don't even know it. He talks about limiting provider choice, imposing burdensome prior authorization utilization controls, much like happens in so many of the Medicare Advantage plans. He talks about the opt-out feature. It's just so really terrible to do that to anyone, but particularly to seniors. He talks about how many beneficiaries purposely selected traditional Medicare coverage because they didn't want to face any kind of barriers or utilization controls or limited provider networks that you get in a Medicare Advantage plan. He talked about the similar arrangement that Medicare Advantage is, a similar model to ACO reach, and that it will incentivize denials of care. Whenever there's a profit motive incentive, you're going to have to, to increase your profits. You're going to deny care. He talks about the profits they can keep from unspent medical care, and these kinds of for-profit models dissuade beneficiaries from seeking care, particularly people who are old and ill. I think sometimes they just give up. And finally, he discusses how this will further privatize Medicare, increase healthcare costs, reduce quality of care. Again, for-profit models always do these things. They, they do not deliver the promises that they claim to make. And I also appreciate that he talks about the poor conditions for healthcare workers. Healthcare workers, the employees who work in um, for-profit uh, you know, models, et cetera, they are often the ones who are squeezed the most. And then he discusses private equity. It does not belong in our hospitals and in our doctor's offices. I'm particularly excited about this. This is another Texas moment. Um, he cites and encloses a resolution from the Texas State Democratic Executive Committee. The unanimously adopted a resolution calling upon the administration to terminate ACO reach. Here's that beautiful resolution. So proud of it. One pager, just really beautifully done, lays everything out. And not only do they ask for Medicare ACO reach to stop, they also want to add to traditional Medicare to protect traditional Medicare, but to also add coverage for hearing, vision, and dental care. There's something else that's happened uh, in August, and there was Lloyd Doggett again and 30 members of Congress. There's really been a push by Congress and also a Senate committee. They're trying to do some things about reforming Medicare Advantage. Um, uh, there, Excuse me, there's a lot of things that are happening in that plan, especially reigning in the aggressive and misleading marketing tactics. I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's just unbelievable. But look at item four. They call for the termination of the ACO REACH program, which unwillingly places beneficiaries in arrangements similar to Medicare Advantage. And again, from Illinois, Jan Schakowsky and Danny Davis signed this letter. So I just want to point out some things as well. We're, we're going, I'm going to be taking you in a minute to or talking about protectmedicare.net, which is a very good resource to help with action steps as an individual or a group. But uh, the, the Texas group, we're working really hard to reach out to retired Americans to make sure that they all know about what's going on. And here are some of the different organizations that have signed on to an organizational letter. These are the list of uh, a lot of the unions that are signing on to the organizational letter. These are all on the protectmedicare.net site. There may be more than these, but this is a, a list that's uh, uh, happening. And then this particular list, these are actually where when you go to protectmedicare.net, you can click on one of these. There's the Texas State Democratic Executive Committee, and they're linked to the actual resolution. So groups can look up the different resolutions to see how they may wanna draft their own. And 
to go, here's the site I'm talking about, protectmedicare.net. This is actually a site within the um, Physicians for National Health Program. They're, they're basically overall website, which is really quite wonderful and has a lot of useful information on it. But if you just pull up protectmedicare.net, you'll go to one particular page that has four sections that's very helpful. You can sign the petition as an individual to end Medicare reach. You can have your group uh, sign the organizational letter. You can ask your local advocacy group to write, and this organization could as well, to write their own resolution to demand the end of ACO reach. As we all know, resolutions are the people's voices. You can write or call your member of Congress. They've got templates and all kinds of, of you know, things, tools that you can use. So you don't really have to create things from scratch. We can also, there's days when we call President Biden, President Biden at the White House. He could also end this program with an executive order. They've got memes that you can use that you can post on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's just very, very useful and, and just very efficient. You can write an op-ed or a letter to the editor. I wrote a letter to the editor thinking it wouldn't be published and it was. So of course it, it was on my refrigerator for weeks and weeks. And this is what that looks like. It's just four really nice clean sections on the protectmedicare.net site. I'll put the, the address in the chat. You can learn more about um, ACO Reach. There's some really good YouTube videos posted there. The Medicare Protectors, Place is one of my favorite places because that's where I look to see, you know, who are the organizations that are signing the organizational letter? Are we getting more resolutions? That kind of thing. I also like the Take Action site because it's just easy to manipulate and work your way through, and it has everything that you need right there. You don't have to go look up your representative's address some other place, et cetera. It's just just very, very efficient, very crisp. And to learn more and to do more, I invite you to go to protectmedicare.net. And I am ready, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I'm ready to actually take questions. Okay, uh, well, now that we're done with this, um, we're gonna take questions. I'm gonna change the protocol a little bit since our speaker's remote. I'd like you guys to go up front to the podium and ask your questions that way to our get to our guests as you can see and hear you real well um if you don't mind uh who's got the first question please go up and uh stand up oh go, go ahead but we want you to go up front this time so that we can see the uh so that our speaker can see you no i don't know okay well who does all right um if not i'll entertain also questions from the zoom audience all right is that jake Okay, Jake, unmute and uh, let's go ahead with your first question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jake. Okay, good. Thank you for your talk. I'm sorry, I came in a little late. Could you repeat again your name and affiliation? Yes, my name is Linda Phoenix and I'm a member of Physicians for a National Health Program and okay. National Single Payer, two groups. Okay. Okay. And what what is what is Medicare OTC? Is that what you called it? No, oh, Medicare. It's, it's OTC, Medi OTC Reach. OTC Reach. It's that's ACO. It's ACO Reach. Uh, ACO yeah, is it? Yeah. Let me get the acronym for that. Hang on one second. Okay. Um. Hello. Yeah, so so still here. ACO, ACO stands for Accountable Care Organization. And an accountable yeah. care organization, those are usually like groups of doctors or hospitals where it's groups that um, manage people's care. It's basically, I would call it like provider networks, et cetera. And then oh, REACH, really? okay, ACO, it, Accountable Care Organization. Right. REACH stands for Realizing Equity 
access and community health. Yeah. So how how is what, what's I mean I mean what is what does that what does that mean for us if we're put into an OC ACO reach network? What does that mean? Well, you you gotta show up on time. Okay, essentially, I'm sorry, but, yeah. Essentially, what that means is you have been auto aligned to something that is no longer traditional Medicare. You have been taken out of tradition. You. Okay, you. and you, you. the letter the letter may say something like, "No worries, you can go to any provider you want." Okay. And, the, and a lot of these ACO reach companies may even honor that for a while, but it's the fine okay. print in the way that the Medicare Advantage companies often do that, where you think you're going to be able to go see someone off network, and then you find out you're going to have to pay, you know, out of pocket. I gotcha. Uh, Linda, okay. I, I would also add right. that the, uh, this can happen, getting the, the, the sheet after they've made that change. Uh, so that's uh, that's why it's so egregious Chris, because uh, Chris, you won't have, know uh, until you have a question or or something like that. Just wanted to add that in. Go ahead, Linda. It, that's a very good point. It, it's a it's a letter that it's not saying, "Hey, guess what? Let us know if you want us to do this." Basically, they're saying to you, and it's usually something like, "Your doctor wants you to have the best care possible." And you have been aligned to the whatever, whatever DCE or ACO reach. It's already happened. And then, again, the only way to get out of it is to go find a different primary care physician. That's a very good point, Chris. Let me also say this. Your primary care physician is likely not uh, the owner of the ACO uh, that you're in, it's, it's probably an employee, and it's probably even doubtful that he or she will know they're in a DCE or an ACO reach. So uh, that's another kind of something that you might want to understand as well. Okay, we have a question from our audience, so go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Linda. A uh, wonderful presentation, a lot of that, a lot of information. You're a uh, subject matter expert where I have a simple question um, and it's uh, on Medicare of uh, uh, A and B. What is the cheapest amount of Medicare that you, that anyone would have to pay for part A and part B if you don't? Uh, can you repeat that? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. So you're based, you're on traditional Medicare? I'm on Medicare. I have Medicare, uh, uh, I'm 72 years old and uh, I work, and, mm -hmm. but I, I do have Medicare. And uh, I'm just looking at some of the, the Google information. I know it's broken in local period. So I'm, I'm, you know, it's such a complex thing and I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, I'm trying to get to, uh, yeah, so that's the base. That's the uh, Okay, I'm still having a, a, a little trouble hearing Your you. Mom, can, yeah, can, can Mike, you talk? Tim is not good. We can't hardly hear you. Um, uh, we'll try it again. Go ahead and try the mic. Yeah, can you hear me now? The question. That's better. Okay. That's the question. So my question is very simple. Uh, what is the uh, what is the least amount of premium one can pay for Medicare uh, A and uh, B per month? I I don't really know what the uh, least amount is. Oh, the, Chris? The, the least amount is the uh, it's uh, F, and uh, but they they did away with that, and I think it's now G. So um, so that was. Uh, that was a change that was made, uh, I think, uh, about uh, a year and a half ago. And they just did it. They didn't ask anybody about it. Uh, Mark, uh, did you, did you have a, a number, a, a monthly number that you? 
you'll have to go to the charts to see. Um, uh, you can, I, I will recommend that you probably call an independent um, uh, insurance agent who probably has that, uh, the latest, uh, uh, the document. Do not go to an insurance company. Do do that. That's not an independent. Okay. Uh, you can get that sheet with the latest information on that. Okay. But uh, like I say, uh, um, the one that was there that was so great is not there anymore. So okay. our next on the docket will be Charlie Paydock. Please answer your question at your next question, Charlie. Charlie, you're up. Yes. Yes. Come Monday morning, uh, Miss Phoenix. I was wondering, should I contact my primary care physician or my insurance company in order to ascertain, have I been converted? I'm not perhaps conscientious of looking at any of my mail, but would it do any good basically to contact either the doctor or the insurer that I have to determine if I have been transferred into this ACO, which you do not recommend. It's going to be the doctor, the office that you have to contact. What do I ask them? Ask him if you have been. If ask him if uh, uh, the doctor and his organization, uh, either one, has um, become a part of ACO Reach. Okay. Okay. Um... All right. Any comments from Linda? Real and, quick? and just in just a warning, the doctor may not know himself because they they're not advised uh, if if they are or not. You know, they're trying to keep this as low profile as they can, so they don't tell the doctors. All right. Uh, let's go next to anybody. Any, okay. Let's Janice. You're the next questioner. All right. Thank. You. My question to Linda is uh, employer supplied uh, health care. Where so many people lost their jobs and then lost their health care. That's a big tax deduction for companies. We got to get rid of that and get us universal health care. Don't you think? Well, yes, I do. Um, and I, that's. And one of the most important things that we have to do while we're trying to make sure that Medicare is not completely privatized, it's, it's already about 42% privatized with the Medicare Advantage plans. So we cannot let the rest of it be privatized because it will make it even harder to uh, continue the fight for, the, for a single payer health insurance. So that's one reason why there is such a, a push to save Medicare. And, you know, there's been so much privatizing with the VA and also with Medicaid as well. So that is one of the pushes. I totally agree with you. I mean, I've been at this for years. Um, it's just, I don't know what it is about the United States of America, but we, we keep trying and we keep, we keep a good idea alive. Okay, um, anybody um, else in the audience? I guess not. Uh, Margaret? Disappointed. You're next, Margaret. Uh, uh, Linda, I heard you speak before. Uh, I, that very night, I wrote to my PCP, who's in a concierge service, North Texas Health Providers. Uh, Randlow's comment, Margaret, rest assured, because I had a letter similar to what you were talking about. This is by Charles. Yes, contact your physician. I also contacted Medicare that night. Uh, Randlow, my physician, rest assured that NTPHP's participation in UTSW's ACO, Accountable Care Organization, in no way affects our doctor-patient relationship. NTPHP joined UTSW's ACO several years ago. It is not an HMO or PPO. You are free to use any hospital or see any doctor you wish. I'll be happy to discuss this issue in greater detail over the phone if you wish. And his CMA said, send us a copy because we want to take this to our board because of that letter and you know, have it clarified. Now I also, so I certainly advise everybody, get in touch with your PCP, get in touch with Medicare traditional if you have it. Chris, you were talking about plan F. That's my impression. 
I may be wrong. Isn't that United Healthcare's supplement? I mean, that's what I have. United Healthcare refers to my Medicare supplement as Plan F. Um, no, the, uh, uh, Plan F is your uh, is your uh, your B, and uh, your your uh, Medigap is a separate insurance company that uh, puts that together. Well, and I, I agree. A, my United Healthcare supplement, Medicare supplement, is Plan F. When did you apply for it? Oh, about three years ago. And they you're, then you're inside. But uh, yeah. a year and a half oh, ago, they they is. killed it. They killed it for everybody else. Oh, you mean Plan F? Yes. Plan G. You can't get it. You can't get F anymore. Oh, okay. Well, I have Plan F, and I yes, that's plan right. G. I thought they had killed Plan G. Which no. Okay. Well, I'm fine. I'm I check this stuff out. I'm obsessed with it. And when we get into commentaries, I'm, I've got something else to say, but I don't want to take up the question and answer like now with things. I'll by, the, by the way, uh, you need to talk to your attorney because that letter is as bad as is uh, useless as the one I got right here that doesn't even talk about a, about advantage. You put it in the very fine print in the very back. So these companies are trying to hide the ball and you're going to have to have check with your attorney because these folks have been caught before doing this stuff. And, um, and just make sure that uh, you get it cut, you get it to address because you may end up having to change your doctor. I doubt it. Frankly, I've had him since the 70s. I pay concierge services. I appreciate your concern, but I spent a great deal of time after Linda spoke because I thought that was very effective, Linda. Immediately, within 15 minutes that Saturday, Thursday night, Randlow Smith and then his CMA responded. So I'm not, at this point, I'm 81 years old. I'm not going to sweat it. When we get into something else, though, the rebuttals, I've got something to say about these COVID tests. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. We're going we're gonna to move on. Um, we, for those of you who just, just joined us on Zoom, we have been doing the hybrid meetings back in Chicago again. We had to start about an hour earlier at five instead of six. So if you're not used to it, you know, we do start at five. Um, and it's just again, a, just a reminder that uh, if you have joined us, we've already done the presentation and we're in the question and answer period. And we will be into the rebuttal soon. Anybody else from our audience got a question? Anybody else in the audience got a question? Okay, if not, we're going to let Charlie Paydock go again. Come ahead, Charlie. Yes, uh, Ms. Phoenix. I, I have Medicare A and B, and I'm not involved at all in anything else, C, and so forth. I have really, really adequate health insurance. Am I still affected by this change? Well, you could, when you, you, you're on traditional Medicare, yeah, is that right? Indeed. And then my, make it up with my own private insurance. With your gap policy. Well, you do have a target on your back because I, I, I do too. I have a gap policy and I have traditional Medicare. And that would happen again is if there's two ways it can happen. If your primary care physician is part of a practice that is either becomes a DCE ACO reach or um, uh, you know, basically is bought by an ACO reach, which by the way, can be a Medicare Advantage company, they're buying ACO reaches and forming ACO reaches, then yes, you could be aligned with that where you could get one of those letters. It's just important to always you know, check your mail and read your mail where you would say, again, something along the lines of your doctor wants you to have the best care possible and that's why uh, you have been aligned or you've joined his ACO DCE reach entity. So that's something that you do need to check. The people with the that are targeted for this are people on traditional Medicare. So it, it's just something that you do need to pay attention to. Who sends and, this letter? Well, it's the company sends the letter. 
So it's really very sneaky what they do and how they set up their doctors. So the, the company, let's call it whatever it is, ACO, Reach Company, United, whatever, they send the letter or it could come from Cigna. Cigna has a DCE, ACO, Reach. But the first line is something along the lines of, you know, you're a doctor, you're a nurse practitioner, whatever, that primary care person that you use wants you to have the best care possible. So right away, you're feeling warm and good because, you know, I, I love my primary care physician, totally trust her. And then it starts telling you that this has happened. Here's all the great benefits you're going to get. Nothing's changed. You can go to any doctor you want to, et cetera. You can, you know, you can go off network. And again, because these are so new, there it could be that some of them operate okay for a while where, yeah, you can go, you can go see a specialist and it doesn't cost you more. You can go out of their provider network. The concern always is that when a system becomes more and more privatized and handed over to for-profit corporations, they control it and they start to change things. They start to chip away at the benefits. So that of course is the concern and then on a larger concern is what it does to the whole Medicare program, how expensive it is. Right. Follow up. Is there any way to tell by going to the website of Social Security uh, any information regarding this? On, on Social Security, no, I don't think so. And if you go to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, you can't really find, you can't, for example, find out who the ACO entities are. You just find a glowing um, description of the program, like it's the best thing in the whole world. So that, that's another well, thing. If I look, if I look up is, my account in Social Security, I wouldn't find this information available. I don't believe you would, no. Okay, let's move on. Jake, you got another question. Jake, you got another question or not? He put his hand up, but I guess he's not. Okay. Me? Yeah, go ahead. Jake, question. Okay, I didn't, I didn't tell him. I didn't tell him my name. Um, you get this letter after it's happened or when it's about to happen? Can you say that again, please? You get this letter, you get this letter after it has happened or when it's about to happen? After. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no um, warning. This is coming. I believe it's after you have been aligned. Because I I don't think I said this in the presentation. This is something else you need to know. But the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services actually, let me see if I can find that, that slide real quickly. They're able to go in and look at beneficiaries records for the past two years to determine who has seen a primary care physician who's aligned with the DCE. So for example, maybe you're in another city or you're on vacation or whatever, something happens and you go see a primary care physician who happens to be part of a DCE. So that record is in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services database. So believe it or not, see Centers for Medicare Services is actually looking in that database to see if you have ever been, uh, you know, seen a primary care physician associated with the DCE. That's another way that they can snag you. So this is why it's, this is so stealth. Okay, so my, my, my follow-up question to that is, as I understand it, Medicare organic is not as bad as this. So can, I mean, I think we can sign for Medicare organic and then keep our keep our primary care. Should we go ahead and do that to avoid the lesser of two evils? Well, except let me just say this: the Medicare Advantage plans are they there are incredible complaints about the Medicare Advantage plans in terms of people not being able to. Let me just basically put it this way: if you're fairly healthy. You do pretty well on the Medicare Advantage plan. 
It's when you start to develop things where you may need to go off one of their networks and see a specialist, or you have one of those kind of mystery illnesses, which is what my mother had, very hard to diagnose. Everything was great until it got too expensive. So there are quite a few complaints about Medicare Advantage. As a matter of fact, the Senate committee, a, a committee, um, uh, recently released a report about the problems with Medicare Advantage. There are so many, many problems with Medicare Advantage, not just uh, the aggressive advertising and stuff they're doing, but the way that they're tricking seniors into plans, telling them that you can go see the provider of your choice. And then once again, it's always that fine print. You get in there, they trap you, and you can't do anything until open enrollment. So I'm not, I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to tell people go with either kind of program. I do not have a high opinion of Medicare Advantage either. That's all I'm trying to say. Linda, maybe you can explain this to me real quick. My mom is 85. She's elderly. We get at least six or seven spam calls a day from Medicare. Uh, can you explain how that happens? Or is it part of the program that you're talking about now? You're getting spam calls from Medicare Advantage companies, yeah. from private commercial insurance companies. That's not from traditional Medicare. Traditional Medicare is not going to do spam calls and robocalls. Those are Medicare Advantage companies. And you bring up a good point, Tim. So many seniors are confused. They think Medicare Advantage is traditional Medicare, but maybe just a different kind of plan. They don't understand that it is a commercial uh, health insurance entity. The government basically contracts with Medicare Advantage companies. It's private commercial companies. And they are on the hot seat right now for those aggressive marketings, for the robocalls, for the flyers that come to your house that look very official, like it's from the government, for going to grocery stores, and tricking seniors into uh, signing up for Medicare Advantage plans, telling them their provider, their primary care physician is on there. They're doing lots of aggressive marketing. All of those things were loosened, by the way, during the Trump administration. And so now during the Biden administration, they're trying to reel that in. Yeah, because I mean, to just to smoke today alone, we must have had a uh... 10 calls. One of them was legit from my sister, but we must have had at least 10 calls from these robocalls calling. And it's driving my mother nuts because she's no longer driving and no longer at home. But she is just absolutely livid about doing these things. She's almost wanting to disconnect the landline, which I said was a bad idea because of an emergency. And unfortunately, they trick a lot of people. There's countless stories where people go, oh, look, I can get some money put back in my social security check. And they don't, they don't understand that they're not switching out of traditional Medicare. There's nightmarish stories uh, in different articles and stuff where people are tricked. Also, uh, Linda, I would add that uh, people need to know uh, that it's easy to go from uh, traditional uh, Medicare to, uh, to uh, Advantage very easy. But if you try to go back, uh, which I had to deal with with my mother, uh, they gave you a six to uh, maybe now eight page document to fill out. You got one little thing that goes wrong and it's uh, you can't get back in. Okay, Sharon, you got a question. Go ahead. Um, I'm you. Okay. Go yeah, ahead. you know, uh, well, <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I forgot that you guys were starting early, so I missed the whole presentation. But I just wanted to say, I am I am on a, an Advantage plan, and I'm considering going back to a straight Medicare with um, the regular supplementary plans. Um, you know, right now it is cheaper, but if I get really, really sick, of course, then it's um, more expensive to do it my way. But even with the Advantage plan, my yearly out-of-pocket is 8000 which isn't horrendous. You know, if you're going to get really sick, and um, you know, I have $500 glasses and things like that that wouldn't be covered, and no dental. Um, but so, what is that the 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 thing that you're talking about? You you used an acronym. 
what is the name of it? Okay, again, it's ACO Reach, and it, it is a, a new program in Medicare that would really uh, target people on traditional Medicare. Okay. They're trying to, to rope them into basically a Medicare Advantage kind of plan. Oh, okay. Well, my, my plan actually has been very good to me, and I, I don't have any problems with any doctors I want to see, um, other than the doctors not being available because you know, everybody's, we don't have enough doctors in this country, apparently. I'd like to. Karen, yeah. I, I, could I add? Uh, if Tim records, if it works well, we'll try to have this posted in the College of Complexes lecture library. Okay. And that's, if you go to the main website for the College of Complexes, look right at the top of the little guy with a camera, and we'll try to have this posted within early in the week. Okay. Uh, so you can check back and watch the program from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I know where I, I can find it. So yeah, I'll probably do that. For sake of our audience, I'm just gonna post the, uh, for our lecture library is real quick as soon as I can get the uh, screen up for it. Shouldn't take but a second here. Um, I'll just post this up, uh, be a brief, do a brief share screen on this thing so that we can um, you know, show, show it. As you can see, if you go right here, to our main website. Yeah. Click the I, I, icon there. I know a lot of people did, but we can, uh, as you can see, we got everything going back quite a ways. Now, last week's is ready to go. It's just, I haven't given a link to Charlie yet, but it will be very quick. And then this week's will probably be done tomorrow night. So you'll be able to see it again. Um, other than that, I'm gonna stop the share. Uh, okay. okay. Um, we could, have could I? Could I just go back and follow up with something that Chris said? Because it's a really go right good point. Go right ahead. Uh, so he was talking about um, going from Medicare Advantage back to traditional Medicare in open enrollment. He made a really important point about how you can you make a mistake in that application and they kick it back. But you know, the goal is to try to trap you into a for-profit you know, model like Medicare Advantage. I also wanna say this, that one of the things that we got with the Affordable Care Act for pretty much everyone except senior citizens is that you, know, you couldn't be denied coverage for a pre-existing condition. That was one of the big things that we got with ACA. However, with uh, senior citizens, that was not extended to GAP policies. Not at, when you first get traditional Medicare and you get a GAP policy, that's fine. But let's say you switch over to traditional, excuse me, to Medicare Advantage, and then you go, I want to go back to traditional Medicare. There are some states where they do not honor that pre-existing thing for a gap policy. I'm not saying that would happen to you, but you could be in a state, and I don't know which ones right now, I'm sorry, but where you go, okay, I wanna go back to traditional Medicare. I'm gonna get a gap policy with whatever. And then you start to find out that because you have pre-existing conditions and what senior citizen doesn't have pre-existing conditions, that you may have trouble getting a gap policy. So I'm just kind of letting you know that as well, that there is just has, I swear, I believe the government has been trying to put all senior citizens and people with disabilities who qualify for Medicare into for-profit entities. And that's why we have to do everything we can to fight that. What is a gap policy? What is a gap? What is a what does a gap policy mean? The gap policy that's in traditional Medicare, where you carry like a gap policy uh, that covers twenty percent of what Medicare won't pay. Does that make sense? It's like I have, I have my Medicare payment that comes out of my Social Security, and then I carry a gap policy with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So. Didn't that used to be called supplemental, or is it still called supplemental? Is it another name? It's supplemental. 
it's it's, it's supplemental is a name or some people call it a gap because it it fills in the gap okay um tony you got your hand up go ahead and ask your question yeah yeah i wanted to ask a question to linda because uh you know on commercials that they have where they want to uh get you into getting an advantage program they tell you check your check your zip code you might get a hundred dollars from social yeah. security and my understanding is that medicare does not have anything to do with social security so where they come to tell you that i don't know but uh, what is, what is that all about linda uh well there's two things and thank you for bringing that up um what happens is, you know, from, from our social security checks, our traditional medic, our Medicare payment is yes, uh, deducted. Uh, so uh, what some of these Medicare Advantage plans are doing, or they're promising that you, if you know, check your zip code, if we like the zip code where you live, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute, then uh, you just may qualify for one of our plans and we will put money back into your social security. In other words, you won't have um, this deduction come from your social security. You'll get some money back in your social security. I don't know the mechanism of how that happens, but that's, that's what it is. Now about the zip code thing is they're looking, Medicare Advantage, a lot of these plans, particularly the independent plans, these are for people who maybe they didn't work for a union, or maybe they didn't work for, you know, some big, like uh, my friends who taught at University of Houston, they offer an advantage plan, like one of the uh, sort of a big entity, so to speak. So for a lot of people that are out there in the market by themselves trying to get a medic, trying to be on Medicare, and they are often prey for these particular ads, is they're looking to see where you live. Do you live in a poor part of town, are you low income? Uh, do you live in an area of town where the air quality is bad? They're, they're really kind of determining what the risk is to cover you. So that's part of why they have that zip code thing. And then again, they make these different perks like money could be put back into your social security. As a matter of fact, in that report that the Senate just came out with, I think it was in October, they gave an example of an elderly man that was tricked into signing up for a Medicare Advantage plan, I think at a grocery store. And there were several things wrong with it. No, the money was not put back in his social security. No, he didn't get to go see his primary care physician. It wasn't on the network. And the third issue was a drug he really did need was not covered by the Medicare Advantage plan. Okay, Charlie, uh, you can go ahead, you're next. Okay, Charlie, on mute. Yeah, well, everyone, please mute if you're not speaking like I am. Please mute. Um, Linda, has this AARP taken a position on this matter in any fashion? I've heard differing views regarding this organization. Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't really find AARP credible at all with this particular issue. I mean, yes, there's their little magazine is good for other things, but let's face it, AARP Hawks gap plans. Uh, they do Medicare Advantage now. They are in the for-profit health insurance business. Interestingly enough, one of the uh, companies that they hawk is United Healthcare, which the Department of Justice is going after a number of major health insurance companies for bilking Medicare Advantage and United Healthcare is at the top of the list. It has some of the absolutely worst practices for tricking seniors, for upcoding, and for defrauding the government. So AARP, um, that's who they have partnered with to for their for-profit arm. For whatever reason, I 
believe in their, you know, they have a charter and I can't remember all that was in the charter, but it's supposed to be this nonprofit advocacy group for seniors. They definitely drank the for-profit Kool-Aid and now that at least with their, their Medicare business. So I don't find them credible. I can't imagine we're going to ever open up our little magazine and find an article where they're going, this is horrifying. These ACO reach programs are horrifying. <laughs> we're not going to see that. They might even actually have some kind of thing like this ACO reach is better than this ACO reach. I don't know. But I, I personally don't find them credible on this issue at all. Great question, though. Okay, Thanks for Brenda, what we're, we're going to do now is we have no rebuttals and we have no more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Jake, go ahead one more time. Unmute, Jake. <clears throat> Jake, unmute. You raised your hand. Go ahead, Jake. You raised your hand. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I hear you now, Jake. Uh, okay. Just follow up question. Um. Yeah. I, I I've I've seen those advertisements on television, and they're very misleading. They don't even tell you that they're coming from United Healthcare. And I'm wondering if anyone's filed a class action suit uh, against the company for misleading advertising. I don't know. That's a great question, Jake. I'm not sure. I, I do know that uh, Department of Justice is going after them. And yeah. there were whistleblowers within these Medicare Advantage plans that have, you know, yeah. brought attention. Yeah. To them. But I, I don't know. It's a great question, though. Okay. Yeah, I mean... Because, because uh, 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 you know, as you say, the this, this senior bought into it at a grocery store, and he's built. And and most seniors don't have most seniors don't have money to to waste on stuff like that. You could you could bankrupt some you could bankrupt somebody that way. Okay, uh, Jake, that'll be the final remarks. Linda, please answer that, and I'm going to move the rebuttals after the after your I'm just putting protectmedicare.net in the chat. You're absolutely correct. And the thing that really bothers me is so many seniors, you know, people are sick or they're overwhelmed or, you know, they, 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 the last thing they need to be doing is trying to figure out all of these things and, and including how they were uh, victimized by Medicare Advantage. Uh, oh, I think I misspelled it. Someone was asking in the chat uh, earlier about, is there some kind of something they can say, a meme or something about the Medicare Advantage plans if you post somewhere? I would go to the medicare.net um, site that I told you about. You can go, there's, a, there's one section that's got memes that you, I don't know if it may just all be ACO reach, but there's some memes in there. And there's also plenty of copy to be able to come up with something kind of snazzy if okay. you want to shoot that around. I think that's really important. That, that protectmedicare.net, if you want to keep finding out things and looking at things and going back and trying to figure stuff out, I can't, I mean, I just can't say enough good things about it. Uh, you know, for me, I'm always looking for one place to get stuff instead of being all over the internet. All right, now what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go into our infamous rebuttal period. You guys, if you have rebuttals on online, you're gonna, uh, again, clasp your arrows up. And what we're gonna do here now is we're also gonna go to our rebuttal section here live. I'm gonna do the first one and uh, we're gonna get our little, Podium is showing up here again so that we can uh, get our rebuttals going real quick. And I'm going to do the first one. And then, of course, we've got uh, Charlene and we have Sharon. We'll probably, since we've got about an hour left before we have to log out, we're probably going to give you about five minutes each, but I'm not going to take the five minutes. All right. Can you guys see me up here now? To quote Monty Python. One moment. Go ahead. Speaker. Yes, thank our speaker. Yes. Give our speaker a hand. You guys can hear from here. Guys, 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 give her a hand. Give her a hand. Uh, yes, oh, yes, Linda, yes. Linda, Linda. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, 
Jim, I would like to to find out if there would be an opportunity for your um, for your group to uh, endorse the uh, resolution um, before we leave. Well, we will. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you what. We'll take a vote on it for endorsement of the resolution. Charlie is the one in charge of that, but we'll be more than happy with this. No, we don't take. No, no I'm sorry. Can you uh, can you guys uh, see me now and hear me pretty well? Yes. <clears throat> okay. First of all, you guys remember the old Monty Python sketch? Nobody expects the Republican Inquisition. Amongst our most adamant and diverse weapons are fear, surprise, ruthless efficiency, and the most manipulable emotion to Donald Trump, as well as a relentless drive to privatization and profits. You're hard to hear. Huh? That means. Difficult to hear you. What? Can you hear me? Get closer to the phone, to the microphone. Can you hear me well enough? No, I can, yeah. All right. Anyway, what we're, what we're trying to do is uh, basically, this, you know, I've often said that the United States has the largest healthcare costs in the world based on the thing. We're the only country that does not have any sort of uh, publicly available health care. And it's often this mishmash of privatized things. It may have worked during World War II, but Again, the profits in these companies have just got to be too much. The British, the British National Health Service, for example, does well. Canadians do well. And most every other country, you're not going to go. The one of the side effects of the drugs that you not take may cause bankruptcy is something that's there. You know, you walk into the drugstore and you say, what's the side effect of this drug? Oh, it may cause bankruptcy. <laughs> and that's what half the, half the damn medical debt that's going down is. I think we could do a lot more in this country if we uh, got some form of things. I get my health care from the VA, and that's a completely uh, public insurance, and I have a small copay with it. But frankly, I'm very happy with the system that I'm on. I don't have to worry about uh, going in deep debt to get any things. Versus my mother, who's got about uh, insurance, Medicare. It seems like me and my sister are always putting through uh, payments for stuff. And my dad recently just passed, and uh, and it's amazing the amount of paperwork you need just to, to it would almost be easier just to stay alive for a while and put all the paperwork through and die with the certificates and everything else. Like you got life insurance policies and all that stuff. It, it, it is kind of funny how much bureaucratic debt literary there is in the processing of a debt. I mean, even when I was in the Navy, it was just a simple matter of a couple of administrative remarks and the uh, personnel left and the debt be declared dead. But here in the United States, it's just sometimes too much. Okay. Who's got our next rebuttal? David, you're going to come up next. Then we'll go to online after that. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank our speaker for an extremely provocative, stimulating, and interesting presentation. We spend a that they had drunk the for profit Kool Aid. <laughs> I couldn't have put it any better than that. In fact, I'm sorry I didn't think of that myself. Um, with regard to action by Congress, I think that any action on health care from the, from the moving Republican House, I think we can forget about that right, right then and there. Republicans have already said they want to dismantle Medicare altogether. And I would say this regarding the Trump solution. Anything. When I was born, that was about the time the medicine show disappeared. And they used to travel the country with jugglers and acrobats and singers and so on. And they would come out and perform for a couple of minutes. And then the, 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 the partner, the fishman, would come out and say, Let's hear it up for, let's have a lot of applause for these sweet singers in the sound. Now I'm here to tell you about. The wondrous elixir, elixir of the ages, from Doc Oz's wizard oil and Doc Trump's tincture of gridiron. These wonderful elixirs, all available to you for just one dollar, one ten dollars, guaranteed to cure women's complaints, men's complaints. It'll cure cancer. It'll. It's a great stain remover. <laughs> And all these, all these miracles can be yours for just 
one dollar or a dollar fifty per ball. And that's about what the, uh, all the description that Donald Trump and all the rest of these people like Doc Oz. That's about all. Oh. Hey, how are you? Hello. Rebuttal. Okay. Okay, Charlie, we are unmute. They're next for the rebuttal, Charlie. Sure, hang on. Hey, thank you again. All right, Doc. Uh, I guess Charlie unmuted. All right, Sharon, you're going to go next. Unmute. Okay, Sharon. Unmute. Okay. Next, go ahead and unmute and start so, your rebuttal. Oh, well, so I have, uh, a, a, I don't really have a rebuttal. I have some comments and then actually a tiny little question. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know, I get, I get the spam for the, for the advantage uh, programs, as well as actually for, for just regular supplemental Medicare, because there's a variety of companies that will offer that as well. Um, but, and I think the reason that people are buying into uh, the Advantage programs is probably the reason I did initially is that um, I, I pay no, no premium, but I do pay um, co-pays. And it turns out to be fairly cheap for me right now. Um, but like, as you said, if you're, if you're um, you know, as you get older, you have more things happen. And, you know, if you get more sick, you wanna be on the supplemental because there will be no co-pays or, or anything like that, but uh, but you do have to pay a premium with the supplemental program. So I think that's why people buy into the advantage, right? Zero zero premium with that, and uh, and a couple hundred dollars or whatever premium with the regular supplemental. Um, but my other question is, so that was just a comment, an observation. Um, uh, at two very very quick questions. One is, um, you know, each state has has people designated to help you make decisions with these? You, you know about that, right, Linda? What do you think of those? Uh, the SH whatever people? I, I can't really comment on that because maybe there's someone else who's had experience. When I went on traditional Medicare, this has been, I forgot, whatever, five years ago, we used a, an insurance broker who had always been our insurance broker. So he just yeah. kind of, you know, he said, I recommend this, that kind of thing. So maybe someone else has had experience um, talking yeah. to one of the, yeah. Yeah, I, I forget what the whole acronym is, but um, uh, I did visit one and, and she was very nice. She, she gave no opinion on anything, which I really, really appreciated. And she just, you know, when I, I, I picked a few things to look at and she did some price comparisons for me. So um, I appreciated that. Um, and then my other question is, isn't it also the case that companies like United, in addition to the Advantage plans, don't they also have supplemental plans? They're, so they're all for profit, right? Yeah, U United has gap plans for Medicare. It has Medicare Advantage. It also has you know, just commercial insurance for other people. Yeah. You not and United is getting in, and as many of these uh, insurance companies, this is really terrifying. They're getting into the provider business too. United has an arm called Optum that is purchasing physician practices. They just purchased okay. Kelsey Sebo Clinic in Houston. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I'm with um, I'm with an Aetna Advantage plan, and they have they have purchased. CVS, or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know who purchased who, but it's it's huge, you know. Um, and I feel like I'm I'm kind of stuck then because I have to choose just for my uh, medicines. Uh, anyways, that's it. Oh. You want to go? You want to go give a rebuttal? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. Our next rebuttal is going to be. Um, Ellen Corley. Ellen Corley. So please go ahead, Ellen. Okay. Let me get the let me get the camera on you. All right. Hang on, Ellen. Go ahead, Ellen. Okay. You're on. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I like. We'll this get you next, Anthony. Forum, go ahead. Uh, the free speech forum, because the last few years it's given me a chance to 
practice public speaking or you know put my thoughts together around issues that are most important. Unfortunately, I don't really think that you know to me what's most important is people are dropping dead because of the vaccines. It's called sudden death syndrome. Luke and I were you know heard that a perfectly healthy lady died. Um, you know, and this is happening, especially black and brown people. It's the nature of this vaccine. It was designed as biowarfare. It was designed to cling to the epithelial cells, to, you know, there's different batches you can check. You know, because the last two and a half, almost three years, you know, this was planned going back to, you know, many years. And it, we got this technology from the Nazis, but this has been, you know, the right reset slash swap. The facts are there. It's being censored. We are being basically, and the, the, it's amazing, the American Medical Association, just denial. You know, there, if a doctor says they are, you know, this is the greatest existential threat of our time designed to depopulate us for real. It's not just made up that, you know, they want to get us down. Prince King Charles, you know, said this is what he wants. We have, they, it's a Mount Fusion. It's an old eugenics idea to get rid of people, the you know, undesirables. The, we're, they want to go down seven, eight. So they've got batches, and the, but it's censored. And you've got to have free speech, and it can't be censored. That's why I've tried to form, uh, you know, keep this where it's the topics of most importance have to come up. That's what science is. You have to have a hypothesis. And if we only talk about, like, you know, Medicare or this Medicare, that Medicare, this Medicare, this state has that Medicare, that Medicare. Meanwhile, they fire healthcare workers, uh, teachers. I can't teach because I'm not vaccinated. This should, the science, I am a statistician, a market researcher, that only 1% of people, this doesn't qualify as a pandemic. It was a pandemic. But if you put that word online, you're thrown off. This is, you know, only a completely totalitarian system could throw off people. That's why we've got books by Naomi Wolf, this brilliant guy, Lynn Horowitz, um, you know, wrote about this in the 90s. This basically what they're doing is putting AIDS in you. If you want a vaccine, stick an AIDS in your system. They developed it, making the lie like it's, you can breathe it, but it's like it's in this vaccine. That's the nature of it. That's how you go into autoimmune disorder syndrome, right? It clings in there. Your T cells go after the, the try to fight this thing, and then your T cell count goes down to nothing, and you die. You can't resist infection. You'll die of pneumonia or whatever this new thing with pneumonia in it, or the glycine oxy that gets into your, that that bleeds you out, you know, it clings in there like razor blades. The guy that gave a presentation about glycine oxide, hydroxide, that, that's little razor blades in your epithelial cells, he walked out his door and they groaned it. You know, well, you know, what? look at the people who have been groaned for, for saying something. That's, you go back to Michael Ruffer, you go back to Gary Webb. It's our government, our NSA, our CIA, our FBI, that's why, because Charlie told me years ago, he's part of the FBI. That's why he has got me, that they are all about their orders. Let's completely center out, you know, this great, but just it's only on Zoom. Charlie put us all the picking. I wasn't allowed to talk about viruses. I'm not allowed to talk about anything. That This is a totalitarian police state. Nazi, Gestapo, fascist police day and it's invisible and they're getting away with it unless we stop them. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, All right, very uh, Tony, you're gonna go next. Yeah, so uh yeah. I'm you would be glad you got a police state. Okay now Tony you're next and then we'll let Andy go uh after him. So go ahead Tony. Okay thank you uh Linda first of all I want to thank you Linda for the great job that you did in uh, presenting this uh, th this forum here, you know, and but I do want the group to understand that uh, you may be okay now with a with a Medicaid, uh, I mean a medical in uh, Medicare, but 
what we're trying to do here in this forum is save Medicare to keep it from privatizing in the future. You're okay now because you've been covered, but I'm not sure that you're gonna be there covered later. And, that, and I'm not talking only about us that are here in this forum here. We're talking about your families, your, your children, your grandchildren that are not protected yet. Uh, that Medicare will not be there by the time they get to uh, be of age to apply for, uh, for Medicare. So my, my notion uh, here, and, and, and you know, I, I'm a socialist as well, you know, like Charlie is. And, and like a second, probably second to Charlie, because I know Charlie very well. But I wanted to just kind of, uh, you know, say that Chris proposed that we, in, that we allow the, the group here to make the decision whether they want to uh, adopt the resolution. Now, the, the College of uh, Complexes in Dallas unanimously adopted the resolution when Linda spoke to them. So, you know, I, I just like to see a, uh, the group to have the opportunity to do the same. Now, if, if it doesn't pass, that's fine. But I, I, I'd like to have a, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity of this group to endorse the resolution. Now, if, you know, and Charlie was there for that, for the, uh, when they, we adopted the resolution with uh, Tom Berry in the College of Accomplices in, in Dallas. So I would like to give Chris the opportunity to go ahead and, and introduce the resolution and allow the group to decide. No, 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 sorry. That's not decided, that's not, not in our, we'll, I'll have, discuss about this later. We'll have to go with Charlie's judgment on this. Okay, Andy, you're up next, go ahead. And then we'll go to Margaret and Jake again. Go ahead, uh, yeah, if you need a little longer, Andy, we understand. It's still about 6.54, so we got a little time. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'd right. like to make a few observations that um, I missed in the talk or I didn't hear. A little louder, Andy. Okay. Uh, America has a problem with billionaires. Speak up, please. Speak up, please. Get closer to the mic. No, he, he should be okay. Can you try it now, Andy? Hello? Hello? Can, can you hear him? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Louder, Andy. Can you hear me now? Can yeah, you I hear okay. 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 We have to realize that America is number one in several categories. So the first one, of course, is that we're the only modern country on the planet that has people selling their homes and possessions to pay medical bills while they're on the way to bankruptcy. That doesn't exist in any other modern country. Number two, we have a, a huge army of homeless people that have been made homeless by the medical bills. It's totally straight. And we're number one in that category. America is also number one in wealth transfer. The American medical system Healthcare system is actually a wealth transfer system up into the bank accounts of billionaires. I brought three books here tonight. The first one, I, I don't know if everybody can see this or the camera. This is called, this is Professor Duesberg who edited a bunch of world famous virus experts in 1992. Mm -hmm. He put a, a bunch of articles. The title of this book is called AIDS, virus or drug induced. This was in 1992. By 1995, there was consensus among doctors and researchers all over the world that the virus was not the cause of AIDS. There is no AIDS virus. They made it up and announced it at a press conference. HIV was recognized by thousands of the doctors as being simple, harmless retrovirus. The reason people were dying from so called AIDS is. They, were, they had pneumonia or something else or maybe a bad case of the flu. They were told they had AIDS by the AIDS HIV test and they were given a, a fatal chemotherapy poison called AZT. Anthony Fauci oversaw that operation. <clears throat> the intentional poison, 100% fatal that they took according to doctor's orders. They murdered 300,000 mostly gay men in this country. 
and they called it an AIDS epidemic. The media was fully on board. Our media is owned by billionaire predators. And of course, the billionaire predators own and operate a stable of intellectual prostitutes masquerading as our Congress and women. We have a prostitute problem in the Congress. These people aren't, aren't uh, public servants. They're intellectual prostitutes with college degrees, fully owned by billionaire predators. That's what we have. Now, there's two recent books that describe this. I, uh, both of these books are worth the price of the book, simply for the- They're years. worth nothing. What, uh, did you still hear me? Who's yelling in there? Never mind. Uh, the first book is called The Bodies of Others. It's by Naomi Wolf. It's the Bodies of Others is the title. And it's the new authoritarians COVID-19 and the war against war against the humans. It's a war against humanity, which is the worldwide COVID-19 so-called pandemic. The other book is called, <clears throat> the author of that one incidentally was Naomi Wolf. This one is called COVID-19 and the global, COVID-19 and the global predators. We are their prey. It's Dr. Peter R. Bregan, Peter R. Bregan and Ginger Ross Bregan. That's a husband and wife. Peter Bregan. Peter McCullough. Peter, Peter McCullough is listed there, but they have introductions by three famous physicians. This book describes what's going on with the COVID pandemic and why people are dying from the so called vaccines all over the world. It's reported widely now in many sources from around the world, not in the United States that more people are dying from the vaccine than actually dying of COVID itself. So oh. uh, this is, uh, you know, as they, they gave a fatal chemotherapy drug in capsules and killed 300,000 gay people in 1992, this book describes it, AIDS, virus, or drug induced. They got it right back then and it was completely blacked out by the main, mainstream media. Incidentally, these blacked out stories show up periodically in the annual publication of this called Project Censored. Uh, the book is coming out, the 23 edition is called State of the News in America. It'll be, I think, the 43 annual edition from Project Censored in its home states. Got the top 25 stories blacked out. They were chained to America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. I highly recommend, if you only get one book every year, order the one from Project Center. But if you can afford any other books, these two should be on your bookshelf as references. COVID-19 and the Global Predators, Bodies of Others by Naomi Wolf. These are both published uh, recently, the last few months. They give a total history of the mythology we're seeing in the mainstream media every day about the COVID, so-called COVID pandemic. And many doctors from other countries are publishing books now saying there was no pandemic. There were people who weren't dying in that large number. They just told us there was no pandemic. So, uh, and incidentally, one final point, what they're calling COVID vaccines are not vaccines like the old flu vaccine and the others. These are new, MMR, I think it is. MRNA. MMRA. I'm still not on board with that, <clears throat> but um, it's reported that those things are supposed to, their chemicals are supposed to uh, it activate parts of your own immune, uh, immune system. What finally happens is that your immune system becomes degraded over time after taking the vaccine. So many people that are vaccinated are more susceptible to getting sick from all kinds of things than the people that are unvaccinated. They're already had COVID in so, Are you a doctor of some kind? Uh, I'm telling you what doctors are saying. I don't have to be a doctor to report what I'm No, saying. you you just pretend to be one. Be, no, I don't pretend to be one, Charlie. Uh, I, I told you before, Charlie. Put up, put, put, put I got a plumber giving me medical advice. All right. Charlie, where your mouth is. All right. All right. Let's, uh, all right. Margaret, you're up next. Margaret, you're up next. Unmute and uh, start your uh, start your rebuttal. Go ahead, Margaret. Unmute. Unmute, Margaret. I don't really have a rebuttal. I just wanted to alert people 
you should be getting every quarter these Medicare summary notices, check them. I discovered something that looked fraudulent and I still believe it is they're investigating it. Somebody had charged up $750 on the same day I went to a chiropractor and the bill would have been about $50. So they're looking at me a nice letter. I fell for one of those COVID test ads and uh, gave them my Medicare number. I called Medicare. They told me, watch. You know, they, they didn't recognize the number as being fraudulent. They said there are a lot of people making those available. Just watch. If you don't get them, of course, notify Medicare. Check when they come to be sure you got the quantity that you're supposed to get and then start watching these Medicare summary notices. And I found out from Medicare that you can call into the claims department anytime and have them go back and check to see what's been charged. So it's just good information. It's just another way to try to protect traditional Medicare. There are all sorts of fraudulent activities out there. Okay, thanks, Margaret. Jake, you've got your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, yeah, I know you're, I know that your organization is pushing towards single payer, and that's fine. I have I have some real problems with our current medical system here in the United States. My question is, um, if we're if we're now moving towards uh, Medicare and Medicaid, I mean, if, if, if Medicare and Medicaid are now moving towards privatization, then what's to prevent at a later date we have a single payer system? I mean, this is, I'll put it this way. The system is only as good as the people in it. And so if you have good people running a Medicare system, it'll be strong for the people, for the beneficiaries. If you have someone like, like if you have someone like, say, former Governor Bruce Rauner in charge of the Medicare system, um, Houston, Houston have take a sledgehammer to it and knock it apart. So what's to, my question here is, what's to prevent at a later date that we do away with the current system and have a single payer system uh, similar to what they have in Canada, and someone comes along and uh, tries to privatize the single payer system, we're back on square one again. Is that it, Jake? That's it. And one other comment to Andy. Um, repeat. Well. You come in, you, you're saying that you're saying that the whole the the the, the virus is a fraud. What what's cre what's creating the illness? If, if 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 the virus isn't really isn't real, then what's creating the illness? All right, Andy's gonna since we got a little time, Andy's gonna rebut you. Uh, you misunderstood me. I didn't say that there was no coronavirus that, that it wasn't creating an illness. What I meant to say is. And the so-called treatment for the coronavirus is killing more people than the virus. And that's being reported. That's ridiculous. Okay. Okay. This. I don't believe that. Well, you that's know, ridiculous. Nobody believes their, their priests would abuse their kids either. And they, it's one of those things you don't want to believe until you're pushed into the evidence, kicking and screaming. But this is what the evidence is showing. I, 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 uh, somebody asked if I was a doctor. No, I'm not a doctor. I translate books. I take 10 or 20 books on a subject and translate that database of evidence into a one-page book note for somebody to read. You don't have to um, be a doctor to read and uh, summarize evidence from thousands yeah. of other doctors in the world. That's but you don't book. read all the books. What? He said you don't read, let him read finish. all the books. Let him, let him finish. Let him finish. Book, he summarize. reads two books and reads out 10. Let him finish. Let him finish. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, we've been we've been translating books into one page footnotes for 40 years now. And we, we call it a database translation because we don't extract opinions. Like they uh, if I, I if I translated the database on uh, tobacco smoke, I would say that four packs a day is not good for your health. That's a pretty much documented fact. That's not a Democrat or Republican or left or right wing opinion. But, you know, my database translation would say the Earth is round, and we, we got pictures from the space shuttle. These are facts, and when you you get uh, books written by scientists that have worked whole careers on this, thing, get 20, 30, what I call Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends. Albert and his friends. But you only do certain books on, that you like. Let him finish. Let him finish. Books on blacked out subjects. 
not just certain books, hundreds of books on certain subjects that would change America if they were covered rather than blacked out. That's we, we don't know we don't publish summaries of uh, fiction books and all kinds of yeah you choose the ones you like. We we publish books let him finish written by scientists. We're published by scientists that have Nobel Prize credentials in many cases uh, from okay. credentials all over the world. Okay. 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 I want to. I want to. I want to follow up on that just briefly. Um, I'm yeah, not sure what. Yeah, please do. let's follow. Up. Wait a minute. Let's get let back me, to the format. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let no, me. No, Jake. Let me, Jake. No. We have, I, no. no I want to. I asked the. I. I asked the question. So let me follow up, please. Otherwise, I'm no, interrupt this is you. Not our format, I'm gonna man. answer. Hey, I'm gonna. If you don't let me inter. If you don't let me answer. If you don't let me follow up, I'm gonna interrupt you. So let me. It'll take me long. Take me shorter than your interruption. Okay. The, the what I was going to say is um, part of the part of the problem is that the pharmaceutical companies have uh, what's the word um, has have intervene have, have uh, intervened themselves that's the wrong word into uh, the um, the regulatory process. How do we know there are, there aren't mem representatives of Pfizer and Moderna and some of the other uh, companies that are producing the vaccines on the board of the FDA, so it's a big make creates a big conflict of interest. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you made the point uh, that I, I didn't make that point. If I had more time, I would have made it. Yes, the FDA basically is wholly owned by the pharmaceutical, which is watchdog, but it rubber stamps almost anything the pharmaceutical industry wants to put on the market. If it's not instantly paid, and then they have to recall drugs that turn out to be after a year or two, uh, not kind of yeah. have three or four percent of the people dying that are taking. This is uh, happening all the time over the last 30 years with pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that yeah. make sense? Okay, right, right. The polio vaccine took them 20 years to perfect, the measles vaccine was four. These uh, anti uh, COVID vaccines, uh, they rushed out within like a year or two. All and right. so that's why I'm very, I'm very well, suspicious of, of the regulatory Tim, process. Tim, okay. gain okay. control of the meeting, please. Oh, I'll take control of the meeting. I let him speak for a couple of minutes. No, no. Control the meeting. You okay. went off script. We did go off for about five minutes, and that was by my choice. Yes, and you're not supposed to do that. Still got plenty of time. Okay, Tony, uh, you want to do your rebuttal there? You yeah, got... I wanted to uh, wanted to respond to you. You know, I have uh, on my uh, son's uh, wife's side of the family. I had five people died from the COVID because they refused to to uh, get uh, vaccinated. So uh, you have to be vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, you're not protected. And okay. and uh, and I'm sure that there's. I'm only one of the very few families that have been affected by that, I know. Okay, any, uh, Sharon, you wanna go next? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we got off topic and I'm, and I'm gonna follow the off topic thread, but um, I just wanna ask um, Andy and maybe others if they've so quickly forgotten how COVID was slaughtering people left and right before the vaccine came out. Um, and all the hospitals were, were like filled up to the gills and they couldn't find any other hospitals to transport their very sick patients to, you know, maybe the vaccine isn't perfect, but it saved millions and millions of lives. And I, you know, I don't know how you can say that's a bad thing. Uh, the answer, one part of the answer to that why the All right, Tim, let's go. I'm muting. Charlie, you're going to be muted because Anthony, Andy's going to answer. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, to answer your question, uh, what these doctors are saying, uh, what's emerging in these books that are coming from around the world, is that in this country, the cheap, effective, available treatments, which was ivermectin, hydrochloroquine, and the ones that we've been bad mouthing in America, have been used to save lives uh, for a few pennies here and there, a couple of dollars a day. It's cheap, available, these drugs have been around and effective. For 40 or 50 years. And they were banned in America so that people would get sicker and head to the hospital. 
and uh, it's urging that a lot of people uh, died on ventilators because if you have a person that's had to have an advanced case of COVID, many of them don't survive the treatment on the ventilator or remdesivir, which was approved by Anthony Fauci, uh, and they cut off the clinical trials early because people were dying on that drug. It has no effect, no, no beneficial treatment at all. And it's all in those two books I mentioned. Uh, what uh, something was killing people, there was a virus spreading there. I'm not denying that at all, just like it didn't deny that a whole bunch of people got sick during the AIDS epidemic. But what they were getting sick from and what they were dying from, uh, we weren't being given the whole story by the mainstream press and the media. Um, also owned by the billionaire predators. He's going to finish and you go next, Charlie. Okay. No, uh, let's hurry up. Come on. You're, you're next, Charlie, so go ahead and give a rebuttal. Okay, I'd like to thank our speaker, and I must apologize to her. I came here this evening to hear about ACO Reach. However, through poor chairmanship of the meeting, we ended up listening to some other stuff, which was not on the advertised topic. Now let's adhere to our schedule and our format, which has served us well for almost 75 years. Okay, I'll be eclectic as usual. Number one, during the week, I spoke with a regular member of the College of Complexes, and she told me she was taken to an, emer an emergency basis to the hospital for an infection. It cost her $3,000 for an ambulance. And the bill, I think, was only a day or so she was in the hospital, but she was charged $15,000. Health insurance is a crucial matter. It will bankrupt you instantaneously. This is a very serious matter. Um, the, I had used to put together insurance policies for um, the unions for negotiating for uh, employees uh, with the employer provided insurance plans. So I had to take a bit of training on this and experience. You want to get an insurance of any kind to take care of catastrophic situations as I just described. Um, you've got to watch out for any feature of insurance that will appear to be a gatekeeper, which is appears to what they're trying to implement with this echo reach. It has all the features of a gatekeeper insurance in which they determine what type of healthcare provisions you will receive regardless of your condition. There's other forms of insurance fee for schedule and so forth, which are also uh, nefariously bad plans. I heard earlier, someone was looking for econ economics, I think, in insurance. People used to inquire and ask me which plan was the best. And there was some were very expensive and some were very cheap. And my response was, sir, uh, which plan is best? And I said, you get what you pay for. That's what, there's no one that's more efficient insurance and less and less effective. So you get what you pay for insurance. That's the third thing. Um, fourth thing regarding what we can do. At the onset of COVID, I put together a mailing list from people I've been acquainted with through the college and other organizations of every senior citizen that I knew, because we were in a vulnerable population. And I send them updates on COVID that I found legitimate and valid. And I did this entirely on my own. I've been doing it for over two some years. And we can do the same thing regarding protect, um, Medicare.net. You can refer people to the recording when it's posted or to that website and it simply indicates this is a matter 
that you should you should look into further. That's the fourth thing. Um, the uh, 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 other thing I'd like to mention, I'm rather dis disturbed by the fact that the Illinois delegation seemingly doesn't have any real voice in this matter. There is a significant number of liberal elements of the Illinois delegation. Danny Davis is my own congressman, I'm glad to say, but I'm rather disturbed by the fact that the other congressmen have not fallen in line on this issue. And what can we do? I'm gonna contact all of them and say, well, let's get moving on this. This is something I think you should investigate, even if I'm not your constituent. It's of concern of all seniors uh, in the area. Uh, the next thing is we really discourage vote taking at the college. I know you did one the other day. Uh, I kind of said, well, they're, they're uh, rookies. Uh, we invite speak, we've discussed every single conceivable issue under the sun. Um, it brings in confrontation. We don't follow Robert's rules of order at the college. The college, by the way, maintains no membership. So I don't know how valid any vote would be. The college that exists tonight will be dissolved and a new one will come into effect next Saturday. So that's what I mean. And we invite speakers to come. We don't approve or disapprove of them. I think would be an element we should not introduce. As I say, on our own, you can do the thing. I'm going to notify. I'm an officer of the Independent Voters of Illinois. I feel a little guilty that I haven't pursued this issue as assiduously as I have. But come Monday, actually tomorrow, I'm going to contact the other officers that we adopt a resolution, uh, which is an organization that is set up <laughs> for taking position on issues. Last of all, uh, we went off format. And you saw the disastrous results of which <laughs> I came here tonight to listen about Echo Reach. Instead, we've heard some strange conspiracy theories. Um, I do not like the college when we have individuals who practice medicine without a license. We had one member who was prosecuted for that and spent a year in jail. I somewhat, we talk about all sorts of matters matters, but when we get into medical field, people seem to uh, embrace themselves with qualifications when they have no credentials whatsoever. So there's one topic that I've had some issue with personally over the years. We've allowed them to speak, but I don't think the things that they're stating are in any way appropriate or informed. Um, this, these things of that nature. Anyhow, thank you very much. As I say, why don't you do what I do? Contact every senior you know. Tell them to pursue this matter in whatever fashion. They belong to organizations, no doubt. If they're in an activist community, uh, have them contact their congressman. Every, point, every time they contact somebody, it's regarded as eight votes. Um, but that's what I'm going to do, and I encourage everyone, and I, again, I apologize for drifting away from the topic that we were scheduled on the advertise to discuss this evening. Thank you very much. Jake, you got something you want to say real quick? Make it fast, please. Unmute and make it fast. Jake, if you got something to say, unmute and make it fast. He's already been recognized, Tim. Well, all right, never mind then. All right, Linda. Hi. Okay. Hello. Uh, make it Hello. Better. Hello. Make, we can were, hear you ask, were you asking me before? You had your hand up, remember? Yeah, I really. I, I just, I just want to, I just want to rebut Charlie for a moment. I don't think, I, I, I don't think Andy. No, I don't think no, Andy no, was, That's what I mean. What is I, this? Uh, I, I don't think Andy. I don't think Andy was practicing medicine. He was just. He was just. He was just mentioning what he was. He had researched. I don't, I don't see that. You had your medicine. opportunity to make a rebuttal. That was my rebuttal to your your rebuttal. No. Okay. All right, since you're going on, <laughs> one reason we don't allow votes 
is last week the chair allowed them or the week before to take a vote that everyone indicated was I a good guy or no good. <laughs> and you don't allow things like that at the college. I know I'm no good. <laughs> That's just too bad. If you don't like it, get lost. So you may then put it to a vote whether, whether Charles is good or bad. All right. Oh. <laughs> Linda, you have any final words? Yeah, Linda, go ahead. Yes, I do. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you uh, this evening. And I want to thank uh, Charlie for bringing us back to the action step piece of this. And I want to encourage you to um, go to protectmedicare.net to look for template letters that you could use to contact your members of Congress. It's very, oh, okay. very important that, that you do that and you'll have the letter that you need to, to write about the ACO REACH program. I just have a few comments that I put together. Um, so let me just say that uh, we all know that Medicare is a federal health insurance program created in 1965 for people ages 65 and over, regardless of income, medical history, or health status. I think most people on this call have benefited from Medicare. I know I have. I know my father did. I know my grandmother did. She was probably one of the early ones. Uh, she died in 1967. And I do know that, uh, excuse me, she was 67 years old when she died and she was on Medicare and it made a tremendous uh, difference for, for her and also for all of her kids, none of which had a lot of money to be able to pay lots of health care bills. The Medicare program was expanded in 1972 to cover certain people under the age of 65 who have long-term disability. And before Medicare was created, approximately half of people over the age of 65 had health insurance, but they paid more than three times as much for health insurance as younger people. Today, Medicare pays a key role in providing health and financial security to millions of older people and younger people with disabilities. I think we all know this, but it's just a reminder that many people on Medicare live with health problems, including multiple chronic conditions and limitations on their activities of daily living. Many beneficiaries on, on Medicare have modest incomes. Nearly one third have a functional impairment, one quarter have fair or poor health, more than one in five has five or more chronic conditions. Approximately half of all people on Medicare have incomes below 30,000 per person and savings below 75,000. So imagine a person with multiple health conditions and limited financial resources on the phone fighting with the Medicare Advantage Company or an ACO reach company that has denied or delayed the care that they need. The aggressive and egregious practices of Medicare Advantage industry mm -hmm. has taught us a lot about the ACO reach program. We know what it's going to do. It's just another scheme presented as free market that will provide care at a lower cost and all will be well. It won't. If Medicare is totally privatized, all will not be well for seniors and people with disabilities. In particular, all will not be well for the generations coming behind us. I look at my nieces and nephews, and I know it'll be a hop, skip, and a jump before they will qualify for Medicare, and I want it to be there for them as well. Those who rely on traditional Medicare and future generations will not be served well by privatized Medicare. That'll just be a bonanza for commercial health insurance, private equity, and Wall Street. So I give these talk to like-minded people like you to hopefully inspire you to take individual actions and to reach out to your circle of influences like Charlie was talking about other groups that you can ignite to take individual actions and also groups that will adopt resolutions and do all that they can. 
One thing I like to say a lot is that everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And we need a whole lot of everybody's to do something to try to save uh, Medicare from privatization. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. It's been a real pleasure and thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Uh, Tim, can you hear me? Yes, Chris, what's going, what do you need that way? Uh, can you guys use a copy of the resolution? Um, if you want to post a link to it in the chat, that would be great. Uh, Linda, can you post a link in the chat for them to get the uh, resolution? I will try. Oh, I yeah. have it as I have it as a PDF. That's fine. Nice. Let me, let me see if I can. Yeah, let me just let Thanks, me, uh, no problem, minimize and get out of here for a second. Everybody can do it. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to keep the Zoom call open. But if Charlie will uh, take the uh, control, of the room, we're going to probably sign out here at the restaurant so that we can keep on it. I'm going to officially uh, probably stop the recording and uh, transfer controls of the host over to Charlie. So. Linda, if you want to get that in the chat real quick before we sign off. Yeah, let me see if I can get that going here. Why don't you send everything to me, Linda, and I'll send it out to our mailing list. Okay, go. I will do that. So don't put yeah. it in the chat, just email it to you. Well, either way is fine. Oh, okay, but let me see if I can. Okay. Be certain to send it to me. All right. And in the next upcoming announcement with the recording, I will incorporate whatever you send me. All right. This will then Good. stop the uh, official part of the College of Complexes tonight. I will transfer the host controls over to Charlie. So you guys can continue on the Zoom call. So anyway, good night, everybody. Here's the college. Good night.